Americans for Fair Taxation presents the Weekly Chairman's Report, written by Steve Hayes, President of Americans for Fair Taxation, and recorded by Bob Paxton, a volunteer with the Florida Fair Tax Educational Association. And now, this week's Chairman's Report. Hello, I'm Bob Paxton with the AFFT Chairman's Report for Friday, March 4th, 2022. Would the fair tax have made George's job any easier in 1794? Today's chairman's report is guest written by Jade Wally. Now, Jade's a partner in a CPA firm and is on the board of Americans for Fair Taxation. If we truly self-examine, the results can lead us to thought-provoking challenges of who we are, what we do or don't stand for, and give us some simultaneous insights of the most interesting kind. This tactic can be furthered in its usefulness by taking what we believe to be a good idea and not only challenging it, but taking it to an extreme to determine if its precepts still hold true even under the harshest of conditions. Now let's look at the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794. Our nation's first president, George Washington, sidestepped having the country engage in the international war being waged by England and France, electing instead for neutrality. On the domestic front, however, Washington chose a different path when confronted with what some historians feel was the first real test of federal power for the fledgling new nation and its first president. To set the stage, Washington's first Treasury Secretary, and now Broadway star, Alexander Hamilton, had called for the federal government to assume individual states' war debts from the American Revolution. To help pay for this, Hamilton proposed an excise tax on liquor, which became known as the whiskey tax. Now, at the time, the idea of an individual income tax was unfathomable and was actually specifically prohibited in the new country's constitution. However, in those days, excise taxes were allowed and were frequently used. While Washington was at first opposed to Hamilton's suggestion of the whiskey tax, his journeys through Virginia and Pennsylvania, talking with citizens along the way, led him to eventually support the tax, which Congress duly passed in 1791. Distillers and farmers in Pennsylvania were not too fond of this excise tax, and they often refused to pay the federal tax collectors. The rift eventually led to violent confrontations, including tarring and feathering excise officer Robert Johnson, among other altercations. Ultimately, Washington assembled over 12,000 men, utilizing emergency power as stipulated in the Militia Acts of 1792. He rode into Pennsylvania and quelled the potential uprising. He ultimately pardoned two men convicted of treason to help ease tensions. The whiskey tax was repealed a few years later in 1802 by Thomas Jefferson. Now, what if the fair tax were in place at America's founding? If we embrace Hollywood's movie requisite, the willing suspension of disbelief, we may be able to self-examine and challenge the policy and precepts of the fair tax. What we must imagine is that the rugged wilderness and American frontier that existed in 1794 had point-of-sale terminals, computer systems, and mechanisms to easily track retail sales and collect sales taxes, just like we do in modern-day America. Now, given this assumed setting, let's dive in. Imagine a new nation with the Constitution's Article I, Section 8 Taxation Clause having the specificity of a retail sales tax only, the fair tax. Frontiersmen, farmers, and revolutionaries could choose when they were taxed. Their hard-earned income, when they could find the good fortune to earn anything, would be forever free of the threat of taxation, something meaningful at the time given the American Revolution's no taxation without representation protest. They would only be taxed when they chose to consume and spend. The uniformity of the fair tax would be appealing to our new nation's citizens, along with the fact that spending on their basic needs would be free of tax as well, which at the time might be all that most citizens were spending. Now, the aforementioned whiskey tax allowed larger liquor producers to pay a six cent per gallon tax, while smaller producers paid a nine cent per gallon tax. Now, this obviously was not uniform and was in part what drove the anger towards the law and the government. Further, this was a tax on business itself, as the tax was imposed at the production level as opposed to the retail level, despite its excise tax label. The fair tax would have solved each of these issues that drove the farmers and distillers to the point of rebellion. 
Now, I venture to say that a tax on retail purchases above the poverty level would have impacted only the very rich who could, of course, choose whether or not to spend at those higher levels and thus avoiding their direct wrath. Further, the fair tax eliminates 100% of business-to-business taxation in the United States, taking with it the preponderance of the $600 billion in annual U.S. income tax compliance costs spent by our American businesses. These whiskey distillers and farmers would not have even been touched by the fair tax unless they also sold their product to end-use consumers. The local taverns, shops, and distillers that sold their spirits would simply collect the fair tax as they sold their product to their willing consumers and then remit the collected tax to the state. There would be no lobbyists needed in 1794 to determine if whiskey was a food or a necessity of life because the prebate would allow each individual to have the freedom to determine what was a life-sustaining necessity on their own and do so according to their own value system and family priorities. Sounds like the fair tax would measure up to its high standards in 1794 as well as it does today. Now let's go to it, because the reality is that our retail liquor stores, large and small, are well equipped and ready to collect a sales tax, as they currently do for approximately 99% of their U.S. sales each and every day. The next rebellion might entail a much worse calamity than being tarred and feathered, so just imagine what future rebellions we could curtail and circumvent with the passage of the fair tax. In conclusion, what can each of us do? We can write letters and make calls to our elected representatives demanding that if the government really wants to eliminate the burden of filing income tax returns, they should enact the fair tax and do away with tax returns altogether. The great 18th century Irish statesman Edmund Burke made a statement that applies in many ways. Nobody made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. Take back control. Help us pass the fair tax. The IRS will be gone and will pay our taxes when we make purchases. We, not the ruling class and their minions in D.C., will decide how much federal tax we pay. If you have friends who don't know about the fair tax, send them to fairtax.org. Have them watch the whiteboards under how it works, and if they agree, ask them to please join us. Then, contact your members of Congress and the President and demand that Congress pass the fair tax. The only truly fair tax. This has been the Weekly Chairman's Report, written by Steve Hayes, President of Americans for Fair Taxation. Check back every week for news and information about the fair tax and learn why the fair tax should replace our antiquated federal income tax system. If you'd like to receive a copy of the Chairman's Report in your inbox every week, sign up at fairtax.org. 